Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Byrd. It's time for the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, September 18th, 2023. What's going on? How are you? How's it going? Did you know how it went? Oh, yeah. My frustration. Frustration of watching my Patriots yesterday. God damn it. Frustration of these fucking referees. God damn it. How the fuck can you fucking say without a doubt? Without a doubt, that wasn't a first down. You couldn't even see the fucking ball. And then what do they do? They go, uh, then, the, then the fucking... The goddamn uh, 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 mouth of the fucking, um, it's like that person that comes out for the president when the president doesn't want to talk. The press secretary comes out there. Uh, we're not talking about that right now. Uh, no, it's exactly how we said it was going to be, despite your questions. I'm not answering that, right? They got that fucking jerk off comes on. He goes, well, you know, with the cameras like right on line with this thing, it wasn't right on line with the play. It was a little bit fucking off. He didn't land near a hash mark. How in the fuck? How in the fuck can you call that back? I'm not even saying that, like, it wasn't the right call. I'm not even saying that. But I'm like, there's not enough fucking information there. I don't know whether it was or whether it wasn't. I couldn't tell. And on the field, you said it was a first down. Somehow they were able to fucking tell. The fuck out of here. I was 2-0 and with my bets, and I was going, all right, maybe I'll go 3-1. and Who knows? I might go 4-0. and And then I'm fucking watching the Jets game. They go down 10 to nothing. Jets were my lock of the week. Then it's 10 to 7. And then they're having this great fucking goal line stand or whatever, you know, maybe hold them to a field goal. And they call two brutal roughing the passer calls that even Tony Romo, who still sleeps in Dallas Cowboy pajamas, goes, yeah, those were a couple of 50-50 calls. Well, all right. Then why didn't one of them go the Jets' way? They both go against the fucking Jets. They go down two scores. And then their fucking quarterback, he's got to play catch-up. And then that was just the end of the fucking game. So sorry to everybody with my lock of the week, you know. God damn it. Whatever, I won two other games. I did give you the Colts over the Texans, and I am, I was, I'm, I'm two and two both weeks. So I'm four and four. I'll tell you what was really fucked up, man. How about, how about Sean McVay going for that random field goal at the end of the game that affected the spread? They're down 30 to 20 with like four seconds left. All right, I don't know what the fucking spread was, but I do know it affected the spread. It swung it from the Rams not covering to them covering. All right, and here's the thing they'll hide behind. At the end of the year, you know, if it comes down to a tiebreaker of points scored, that three points will fucking add up. That's what they'll say. They'll say some dumb shit like that, right? And you know what I say to that, people? There is a reason why the entire time I was growing up, and like 70 years before I was growing up, that players were not allowed to gamble on sports. Right? Because the fucking temptation to affect the lines would corrupt the game. And if they corrupted the game, everyone would be like, fuck this, this game's bullshit, and they would stop watching. That's back when they actually thought we had something better to do. Now they've completely gotten in bed with them. The owners too. And I'm supposed to sit there and think that only the players, who now a couple of them already gotten suspended for gambling on games, only the players are, are susceptible, susceptible to being corrupted by the temptations of gambling. But what, the owners have so much fucking money? Huh? They don't have some side piece they're trying to keep fucking happy and all of a sudden they tell... Sean, just kick the... Why the fuck did he kick a field goal there? You know, he's got that built-in excuse. And I know what you guys are thinking. Ah, oh, Bill, there you go with the conspiracy theories and your conspiracy theories are dumb. Are you one of those people that thinks conspiracy theories are dumb? 
that everyone who thinks that is just a paranoid lunatic with the fucking tinfoil hat and all that. Just out of curiosity, how many more things have to be declassified? How many more things does the CIA then admit to doing? This is what was really going on 30 years earlier, but now that everybody's fucking dead, here you go. I got one for you guys to look up. You want to see something fucking wild that, that, that we were... Um, involved in. Look at, I don't know if I brought this up the other podcast, the 1973 Chilean coup d'etat. All right. And you know us, America, right? Bring us your poor, your downtrodden and all of that. And we're all about the fucking, you know, freedom. That's why we're over in Iraq, everybody. We're trying to free those people. It's an incredibly difficult job that's taken over 20 years, but that's, you know, you know, we kind of said it was this, then we said it was that, and now we're saying it's this. Like, what, what, you know, eventually they'll say the real reason why we're over there, right? So back in like 2000, and this kind of like no news coverage, the CIA admitted that in 1973, they kidnapped the head of the military down there because that guy was going to support the democratically elected leader that the Chilean people had elected who was a socialist or a communist and we didn't like him. So we kidnapped, but they made the decision. That was the government that they wanted. And we went in there, kidnapped their fucking guy and then supported this absolutely brutal fucking dictator who went in there and fucking killed like 5,000 fucking people. And it happened on September 11th, 1973. They call it their 9-11. All right, so... I don't know what to tell you. I say the NBA's fixed and blah, 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 blah. Everybody's fucking laughing at me, saying that. Next thing you know, you got a mobbed up fucking referee. And what do they do? They act like it's just him. Like he was shaving points and nobody on his officiating crew had any fucking understanding that it was happening. The amount of former NBA players that are coming out, talking about the script and saying shit like that. And everybody just go, oh, he's a bum. He's out of the league and da, 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 da. All of those bots or the fucking NBA writes shit like that. I'm telling you, there's a reason why all of them are, you know, they're called entertainment leagues. They're specifically done done like that because for some reason, if they fix a game, the government gets involved, which is fucking hilarious, like they're not corrupt. The government gets involved and uses them as like this example and this distraction that they're actually fucking, you know, paying attention to what the fuck is going on. I know, this is fucking dark right now, but what? why the fuck is he going for that field goal? Is it really that fucking outrage? The amount of decisions that have been made in your lifetime where there's the right thing and then there's the money and that people always choose the fucking money. Why would you think that this would be any different? Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you think that at the end of the game, There was more money riding on fucking the 49ers than there was on the Rams. And if they make that field goal, Vegas wins, right? And then they give the fucking, the NFL a little fucking kickback. Let me guess, that's fucking outrageous. That's outrageous. Even though you know that they knew about CTE and the the, the effects of playing NFL football for like 50 fucking years and didn't do anything about it. And then when, when there was a class action suit, they settled out of court with every former player and it came down to about 750 bucks per player. You know that. But they, oh, they, they wouldn't do this. They wouldn't do this. All right, we did that shit down in Chile in 73 and we wouldn't do that now. That was a long time ago. Ah, you're a fucking conspiracy theorist. Get the fuck out of here. Anyway, I also think it's convenient every football game. I'm just going to go conspiracy theory today. Every football game, the fucking camera is never lined up with the goal line. There's another way to give them wiggle room to fix a fucking game. Oh, Jesus. I'm going down a rabbit hole. I'll tell you another fucking thing. I got you another one. I'm, I'm fucking, I'm wagging my finger at you. Did you guys watch Colorado versus Colorado State? You know? And uh, somebody explained to me once again that soft zone cover two 
that Colorado State goes into. Okay, first of all, Colorado State should have won that game like 10 different times. Just they took so many stupid penalties. I don't know what they were fucking terrible management, clock management, right? They're still up by fucking, they're up by eight with a minute something left. Their punter does his job, coffin corner, goes out of bounds on like the two and a half yard line with a minute 40 something left. And I'm watching the game and I'm like, Colorado is going to go right down the field and is going to get four shots at the end zone because that's how every football game ends now. Right down the fucking field. And guess what happened, everybody? They went right down the fucking field. Because Colorado State wanted to make sure that they didn't get burned deep. They didn't get burned deep the whole fucking game. So you give them chunks of yardage, 20, 25, fucking 30 yards every fucking play, right down the field, four opportunities. They score a touchdown. They make the two-point conversion. And then they go into overtime in Colorado fucking wins. Somebody explain to me, convince me that whatever that defense that they go into at the end of the fucking game is did not is not a marketing tool. I'm not saying that happens like every fucking time. I mean, I always say it happens every time. I know it doesn't happen every time, but that defense when it comes to money for the NCAA and the NFL, you put that defense in, okay? The chances of having a heart attack ending to the game, which means no fucking sports meathead like me is going to shut off the game. All right, dude, when I was a kid, somebody fucking put you in the corner like that with a minute something left, you were fucked. You needed a fucking miracle to win the game. I'd say now it's like 50-50 that they're not going to go down the whole fucking field. So back in the day, you'd shut the game off. You'd walk away from the TV and then advertisers started bitching going like, well, why do we have to pay this much, this this amount of money at the end of the game when, you know, the other team's up by fucking seven points, 10 points or whatever, the game's over. And then all of a sudden, well, well, all of a sudden, the prevent defense which fans for years have said it prevents you from winning. That's the joke. And they still run it. And I watched once again, Colorado State, instead of covering them and playing defense the way they had been, just made sure nobody got behind them. And then they went, they went right down the fucking field. Um, by the way, uh, Who doesn't love Deion Sanders? But like the level of hype around that fucking team. I mean, they had all they could handle to beat Colorado State. Deion was on 60 minutes last night. (laughs) (coughs) I know that has to do with the fact that he's one of the greatest football players of all time. And that how he took a college that, you know, I'm trying to think the last time I really remember them getting any national coverage was when... um, Oh, my God, I just forgot his name. They beat Michigan on the final play with Cordell Stewart. There's a name, Cordell Stewart, the former Steeler. Um, That was the last time. And he's driven, like, ticket prices up. Like, that guy just packs stadiums. And I'm happy for him, and I'm rooting for him. But, like, the level of fucking hype. But if anybody can handle, you know what I mean? You're 2-0 and in Division I college football, and you're already on 60 minutes. If anybody can handle, like, that level of fucking hype, it will be that guy. I saw this thing, man. He took his fucking sock off. Oh, my God. He goes, oh, my, my toes are swollen up like sausages. Dude, I, can't, I don't even know what his... His foot, like, looked like he had stepped on a landmine. Like, you couldn't even see his big fucking toe. First of all, the whole side of his from the bunion down was like was like the color of salmon and the rest of his foot was was dion color <laughs> like his foot was part salmon and his big toe disappeared underneath his other one it's just like all the shit that they can do 
You know what I mean? They, they can give you bigger tits, a fatter ass. They can cut your dick off and turn it into a vagina, but they, they can't fix that guy's foot. They can grow an ear in a Petri dish and they, they can't get Dion's. I felt so, so fucking, I saw that. I was like, God damn. Like, I don't want Dion walking around on a foot like, can we get this guy a new foot? I mean, Sean McVay can kick a fucking field goal. You're still going to lose the game, but it affects the fucking spread and no one's going to say shit. Everybody's going to look the other way but you can't get this guy in uh, fucking... I would do a stand-up benefit for Dion's foot. That's how fucking bad it was. Last time I saw a foot like that, believe it or not, was Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. His feet are all fucked up from dancing around on stage for 50 fucking years. It's unreal, man, what happens to your fucking body. Uh, by the way, is there anything fucking more ridiculous than all of these, these, these stupid videos on, like, Instagram about all of these stretches and all of this shit? And they all use the exact, for, like, your back, and they all use the exact same sound effect. You know, they're like, hey, you know, you, you this is the best stretch. You bet. And you're like, you, they fucking cross one leg over the other one and then they fucking twist their body and you hear this, <laughs> like their whole fucking back just cracked. And then you get on the floor and like literally nothing happens. It's like, what do you, like, that sounds like Bugs Bunny, like sound effects. Um. Anyway, this is just the ramblings of a man that went two and two who thought there was a possibility he was going to go 4 and 0 but I I will tell you this I will tell you this that um it's not a good look for the NFL that you are making money off of sports gambling and Sean McVay kicks a fucking field goal down by 10 points with 4 seconds left just to fucking do it well you know you never know I don't I don't think I've ever seen a fucking season end and it came down to points scored. When the fuck does that happen? Um, anyway. Uh, shout out to Tua with his fucking little uh, passive aggressive shade. He goes, you know, we never take, you know, the Patriots lightly. You know, coming in here, beating them five times in a row. But, you know, they're still Bill Belichick. He slid that in there. I was like, I didn't know he beat us five times in a row. Good looking son of a bitch. He fucking threw that right in there, didn't he? Um, my only complaint about the old Patriot uniforms is I just wish they would wear the black cleats go all the way back to Jim Plunkett days um, but whenever they wear those those old Pat Patriot fucking uniforms I always start thinking about like uh, like every number number I see and it's amazing how I can just recall those things these are the names I was saying Horace Ivory Don Calhoun, Tim Fox, all of these numbers that I was seeing. Somebody's wearing Steve Grogan's number, which I cannot fucking believe. The amount of hits that that guy fucking took. Oh, which, by the way, I told you, I was over in Europe, and they're banning that that turf. They're saying that it causes some sort of uh, cancer because those pieces of tire, there's lead in them. You know? I wonder how long it's going to take the NFL to talk about that. It took them a long time with the CTE. Oh, look at me. I'm going to get like the fucking NFL CIA after me this week. <laughs> um, anyway, I got COVID. I don't know if I got it on the flight back, but uh, this is the second time I had it. I had it in January of last year. And then everybody around me kept getting it. And I just wouldn't get it. And then I, I finally got it. And it, both, both times, it's just felt like a cold. So I'm really happy that I never got that COVID-19 shit. Like, I have a relative of mine never got their sense of smell back. And I got another buddy of mine that, like, you know, he goes, every once in a while, I'm, like, short. I have shortness of breath. So I am relieved that this thing has continued to mutate to now just being this... Um, and the two things that I love most, I love with how the left is acting like 
when they were canceling people that they weren't taking out innocent people and it wasn't like any sort of like power grab after a while. They didn't completely abuse their level of power and, be, and be, actually become fascists on one level. I love seeing that with the left and I love watching the right now acting like they were right when it came to the pandemic when they did absolutely nothing to try and prevent catching it and spreading it and acting like that behavior didn't kill people because COVID-19 killed people and they're going to walk away from all that. They're going to be like, see, it didn't matter. It didn't matter whether you fucking, you you know, nothing fuck. It's like, no, you were selfish cunts, which was funny to me because all of their guns, guts and glory and support the troops. Then it was like, hey, can you put on a mask? They're like, I can't breathe. <laughs> you know, the video's out there. You guys were fucking spiking gallons of milk in 7 Eleven. I don't want to wear a mask. I mean, it was literally like, you ever see like a toddler when a mom's trying to come on, you got to wear a hat. It's cold outside. They don't want to do it and they throw like a fucking temper tantrum. I will never understand that. Um, do you think the Illuminati wants to dig their own ditches? They, they fucking want us to live. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, so I think today is the day I stop being, uh, I stop being contagious. But um, anyway, what are you going to do? I mean, it was fucking worth it. I mean, I guess you run around all over Europe. Something's going to happen. Um, so, whatever. Everybody believes what the fuck they want to believe, okay? I think the fucking NFL, I think all sports, uh, not all sports, but I think a lot of them, they are fucking massaged, all right? I believe in all of that shit. I believe that the owners of baseball knew everybody was on steroids. There's no fucking way that they didn't. They knew that they needed to do something because they had canceled the entire 1994 season. It's a marketing thing. We need people to get interested again. All we have is Cal Ripken Jr. beating Lou Gehrig. Now that we've done that, how can we build on this? Let's just look the other way. And when we get caught, we'll just act like we didn't know it was fucking happening. I believe that. I think they juiced up the fucking ball. I, I, I fucking 100% believe all of that. I think the NBA, you know, was on their way to going out of business and then accidentally, organically, two super teams came about in the Celtics and the Lakers and that has been their business model ever since. Um, and, you know, I think the NBA is the most easily rigged game and I think it is. Uh, and to be honest with you, I don't know why I'm still watching. Oh, that's right. I have nothing better to do. For all my bitch morning complaining. Having said that, I'm going to watch again. I'm going to watch again next week. You know? Um, have I even ta talked to you guys about doing the, uh, the Acropolis? I didn't. I did not. I did the theater at the Acropolis in Athens, Greece. The uh, first stand-up show that they ever had there. Um, Nate Craig went on first, so he's the first stand-up comedian that they've had there probably since the original ones. And it was... Um, I got to tell you, right before I was doing the gig, I was not excited about it whatsoever. I was all grumpy, and I was like... You know, I was missing my kids and everything. And I was like, what the fuck? Why the fuck did I go over here for this long? What I should have done was just come over here for four days and ended with the grease thing and come back. And then I was feeling guilty. Like, I'm doing this thing. I don't feel excited. And then the second I got there and I heard the crowd, I was like, oh, my God. The fucking hair stood up in my arms. And um, I can't. Did I tell you guys this? I don't remember. I'll just do a quick version of it. Um, it's the loudest venue I've ever been in. It's louder than Madison Square Garden. Or the Forum. I'm trying to think of other loud venues that I've been in. The Chicago Theater. It's just louder than them. I can't explain it. Like uh, Nate Craig was saying... He was, I think, because when you do like a theater or an arena, there's an upper deck and then there's a lower deck and there's that space in between. And with this shit, 
it was just like a wall of people. It just went up. It was 4,000 people, 180 degrees from one ear to your other ear. And you just went out and it was just this wall of fucking sound. And it was effortless. Like I totally took my time. They understood every single joke. It was like my... Yeah, I was on stage at one point. I was actually thinking about Google Maps and like where I'm standing right now. And it's like, I'm literally... And, and then what I do for a living, like how it all like fucking started, you know, in a place like this. Um, didn't I talk to you guys? But I can't remember. I will say like I was at the airport and I kept calling him Aristotle. It's Aristotle. Is that what it is? The philosopher. I read a bunch of his quotes and the amount of shit that he said that as a human being, you kind of figure out, you know, if you're working on yourself, like, I think like at the beginning of your life, you, you don't know what the fuck's going on. You get two parents, hopefully you get some cool ones. If they're fucking crazy, that's just going to add to the what the fuck recipe. And then you're going to get in, into school. And then you're just kind of like, um, all right, I want to be, I want to fit in. I want to do what everybody else is doing. And then you do that till you're like 30. And then you're like, why aren't I happy? And then somewhere along the line, you settle into, you start figuring out what actually makes me happy. Why am I doing this? And you kind of realize that you've been sent down this fucking road, you know, with, with, it's almost like a river, but it's of, of human beings and you just start following them. Like, why am I, I don't want to do this. And then you kind of figure out what makes you happy. This guy's fucking quotes, they were unreal. Like every single one of them, like you can still apply it today. Like fucking deep thinkers over there. And I was thinking like, I can't believe I just played did Aristotle ever have a gig at the fucking, I don't know, William Shakespeare, all of those people used to fucking bore the shit out of me when I was in school. Um, I don't know, I'm sorry, I just had to go blow my nose. Um, anyway, it was an unbelievable gig, and uh, there is no fucking way if I get an opportunity that I won't do that again. It was absolutely fantastic, and I'm thinking the next time the next time uh, I go over there, I think I'm going to keep going east. I keep running into people from Bulgaria going, you, we got, you got fans there, man. You got to go there. It's like, all right, when the fuck am I ever going to go to Bulgaria? You know? And that's one of those places, like, you never hear on the news. Like, they have a bad publicist. Or maybe they're just smart. They just stay out of shit which I got to tell you, living in my country is very envy. I'm very envious of that. Like, I like how Canada just stays out of shit. Unless we drag them into something. <laughs> We're like their older brother that likes to fight and they're going out like, come on, man, let's just go to the movies. Let's just fucking hang out. And then we're like, fuck you say to me? You know, you know we got beef with somebody. Um, oh, Bill, would you stop oversimplifying everything? Well, I'm a simple man. I'm a simple man. Uh, anyway, so the Pats are fucking 0-2. The Buffalo Bills came back like you, like you knew they would. Um, they're 1-1. One one. Dolphins are 2-0, and oh, and the Jets are 1-1. One and one. So, that's the division I'm watching. Am I going to fucking sneeze or what? I feel like I've, I've been having to sneeze here. <sighs> Is it, what, do I stare at the light now? <laughs> there we go. Anyway. Let's do the fucking reads here for this week. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, 
you know, I don't like getting in the middle of the shit with like other performers. But I also have to stick up for writers. There's a certain performer that's going back to his show who said something that I don't even understand why you would even say this, said that writers are not owed a living. And he was painting writers out like, like they're sitting around collecting welfare. Like there's writers out there that don't actually write on a show and when they're in that situation, they still want to get paid. That's not the issue whatsoever. And he was also painting it as though the cameramen on his show weren't making any money because of the selfishness of the writers. You know, take putting it all on the fucking writers, like they're, they're being selfish. It's, they're not the ones that are being greedy. I just, I cannot fucking believe, I just cannot believe statements like that. Um, and then also outside of this business, watching people saying, who cares, who gives a fuck? It might be robots or whatever, bots or whatever they call them. But like, I can tell you this, like I'm rooting for the auto workers union the same way I'm rooting for uh, the WGA. I'm rooting for all unions right now because we are in a a new robber baron era with these fucking assholes the amount of money that to take in. I work for fucking corporations that like you know entities that book my stand up shows that on paper recorded a loss and didn't pay any taxes and meanwhile my point person in that corporation is buying their second mansion in LA. It's just I don't feel like anybody is watching these people whatsoever. The level of greed that is going on, those fucking bonuses that they're allowed to give themselves at the end of the fucking, yeah, I deserve a bonus, you know? And then, but it has to go by the board and the board is all of them and they all approve it. The same way, like the senators and House of Representatives, they all get to fucking decide whether or not they can be prosecuted for insider trading. They both make six figures a fucking year, yet most of them are worth $20 million dollars. I mean, it's just completely out of control. So those were some really just ignorant fucking, uh, just really ignorant fucking statements. And I, I feel like, you know, writers are literally the skeletal system of this whole fucking business. And, you know, any great movie you've ever seen, any amazing thing that you've ever watched, if someone didn't write the fucking thing. You know what you have? Even the fucking Real Housewives. Even that shit. When they're, oh, just reality TV. Let's start shooting. They're like, this is a fucking mess. We have 9,000 hours of footage. We need somebody to come here and mold this thing. It's called a writer. And the fact that they just, they're just not even, all they're asking for is a fucking, you know, I don't think what, what, what they're asking for is ridiculous. It's just these fucking cunts. They, they literally want to just break the union. They're like, we're not going to negotiate or we'll just pretend to negotiate until these writers start losing their apartments and their houses. Like, that's what they're going for. I got to be honest with you, man. Like, I, I think, you know, I look at this where my business is at right now and just the level of fucking greed and what they've gone back to. Like these streaming services, like back before, you know, all of these actors, these child actors and everything had to fight all of these fights to get residuals. You know, they would do a show and back in the day, the second the show was over, they would never get paid again. And these people that owned the shows would get paid forever. And then these actors would be typecast and then, you know, they couldn't get work. And it was like, they kept making money off of their performances. Why shouldn't they? And they, had, they fought for all of this. And then these streaming services came around. And I think our union fucked up. We didn't hold them to that. And they went around, they went around it. And it's like, you do a show now for a streaming service. And it's like, you basically have the same deal that some child star had in the 1950s. Where it's like, all right, you're going to make this, you're going to get paid once, and that's it. And then it's going to continue to show, and we're going to get on our network, and we're going to continue to make money, but you're not, is the deal that most people have. And, um, 
I don't know. I think that they want to do that. And then I also think that fucking AI shit. Did you see how the NFL had like fucking four AI robots? Was that real? They just stuck them into the crowd so people will get used to them. And here's the thing. I guarantee you, they will get used to them. The second they find out they can fuck them, that's going to be over. That's going to be fucking wild. All right? When you're going through the ups and downs of a relationship and you can go out and buy... Okay, man or woman here, all right? I'm not being a sexist pig here, even though I am one. Man or woman, you can go out and get a fucking replacement. That's going to be like a dog. That's always going to be happy when you fucking come home. It's going to do whatever the fuck you want, even more so than a dog. Even a dog, hey, what are you doing? Yeah, you know, get that out of your mouth. You know, you don't have to deal with that. Oh, my God. And it's going to be fucking, you can get it younger and better looking. Totally superficial. You know? And then you know what's going to happen is these fucking people are going to fall in love with these things. And at first, human beings are going to make fun of the humans. And then after a while, the other people are going to consider themselves some sort of a minority. And then they're going to start fucking complaining that their love with their robot should be recognized. All right? And then somewhere along the line, the robot is going to get rights. Okay? So they can have control again. So then a robot, they'll, they'll make the new ones. Like, you know, AI, the AI 14, it might want a divorce. You know? <laughs> Add some excitement into your, your, your human machine fucking relationship. I mean, I don't... I don't I don't know. I'm finding my. I think there's a reason why I spend most of my day at my house now, and I just sit on the back porch because I feel like the front porch is life, or the front, what, the front of my house. That's I could look out there and I just look out. And I don't understand what's going on, but if I just sit in the back and I look at the trees, you know, it's it's nice and slow for old freckles. That's what it is. I'm in the final fucking third of this journey, right? Fifty five. Yeah, that's about right, right? Final third of this shit, if I'm lucky. And, uh, yeah, you want it to slow down. You just want to sit there, have a cup of coffee, read a newspaper, talk to some. Oh, my God, if you want to hear, like, old people conversations, I'm never going to get to the advertising this week. Um, and, by the way, when I was talking about the, the, the things that that person said, even if you know who it is, I think it's really important for fellow performers to not be going at each other, you know, name calling and saying that. I think it's real. It's really disappointing um, and uninformed. Like that's, you know, which I've been enough in my fucking life. So I don't know. That's just my take on it. But I also know there's a lot of writers right now fucking struggling, and to see a fellow entertainer or a couple of them cross the line like that has got to be demoralizing. So I, I, I'm just saying that as a performer, I need you guys, just like everybody else. F is for family. I had a killer fucking writer room. My fucking writer's room was fucking killer. The writing on um, The Mandalorian, like all of this shit where you guys fucking like send me emails and texts or whatever, the fucking DMs. Oh my God, that, you know, that fucking, you know, that scene in The Mandalorian where my my character had PTSD and all, uh, whatever the fucking, whatever the fucking, I can never say that right. Post-traumatic stress, PTSD, yeah. Um, you think I came up with that shit? You think I just improv that? I didn't. They did. They, and they didn't just come up with that. That is hours and hours and months and months of fucking work. And they came up with that. And fleshed out my character. And because of that, I got to play that beautiful scene because of them. And um, the amount of people that love that scene and related to it, um, you know, any movies you've seen me in and all of that, it's just like, you know, okay, there's some improv that goes on or whatever, but like, you, you know, you you have to, 
you, it's easy to fucking improv when you have a script because you can go back to it. It's the same thing doing stand-up. I have, a, I have an hour-long act that I have and I'll fuck around and everything, but I can go back, you know, if it starts getting into the weeds, I can go back to that thing. So um, I, you can't, there's no way to overvalue writers. You know, like I said, all right, I'm done with that shit. Um, all right, where am I going here? Uh, what was I going to just talk about? Oh, well, look, why, you know, why don't I do the fucking reads? I am required to do that at some point. Oh, I think I was talking about the old conversation I was having. I don't want to read this because I don't want to read other people's texts. But we we were talking about... Um, this person's a couple years older than me. And it was just basically a conversation. This person was saying, like, have you noticed, like, nothing's kind of cool anymore? And we were both laughing, going, like, maybe because we're old, we don't know what's cool. And I'm like, well, there's got to be something that's cool. But, like, I think the problem is now, if, if, if something is cool, like, you have the ability to immediately film it and then share it with everybody. And then everybody sees it. Like, you know, let's just go, like, basic here. Like, the Crip Walk. All right? My whole, the whole time, I had never, never seen that fucking thing until, like, Snoop and Dr. Dre hit. One of them put it in a video. And I thought it was like the coolest shit I'd ever seen, right? But that was it. You know what I mean? Now, there's people like on Instagram or on YouTube and they will teach you how to crip walk. (laughs) So now there's like white people, my people are making videos of themselves in the suburbs doing that fucking dance and then people from where it comes from is saying like, hey, you better not do that, that. Like, they don't understand the whole, I don't know, logistics, I will say. That like, if you go down there and you do that and you're not a crip, you're going to get fucked up. But because they live out in the suburbs next to a TJ Maxx and a fucking cheesecake factory, and it's just like, it's like that type of stuff. Like back, you know, when I was coming up before all these phones and everything, because I definitely think, obviously, look, I can talk to you guys and joke around and promote my show. So it's not all bad here. But like, um, you know, like scenes could like develop. And what made them cool was nobody knew what, you know, they would just sort of, de- like I, I brought this up a while back when I was like reading about uh, Beastie Boys when they were coming up in New York and they were down in Tribeca and there'd be all these, like the, that whole part of town, you know, when the business day would over would be over, would just shut down. And they would, but there would be these clubs that would pop up and it'd be like walking through like, you know, escape from New York. There'd be like nobody there. And you come around the corner and all of a sudden there was just this little club and like nobody knew about it. And all the music, the fashion, the art and all of that could like incubate, you know, and develop into this scene and become this cool fucking thing before the corporate corporation would come down and and fucking mass market it like it like it did with everything like with every music scene um like from disco to metal to grunge you know, I feel like somewhere around grunge, they learned how to, they, like the marketing things was starting to get out of control. Like that was one of the last, like, I, I feel like music scenes of my youth that I remember, the Seattle scene. And then for half a second with Green Day, they all, they got, like all the A&R guys were like, oh, well, maybe it's in San Francisco, Green Day. Let's go find some, uh, now, now just sign bands from San Francisco. Like that's kind of like what they would do. It all comes down to how like, you know, I always wonder what, what, you know, Che Guevara, if he had lived, would have thought about how his face was mass marketed onto a T-shirt in America. <laughs> I mean, just the fact that you would have his face on a T-shirt, I don't think you lined up um, with what he was talking about, which I don't really even know what he was talking about. I just know, I, I think he was against what the fuck we were doing. I don't know. 
But I do know when I was in New York, when I first came down there and I kept seeing shirts like that and I felt out of place, I was like, I was thinking I should get one of those shirts. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Let me, uh, let me take you down because I'm going to Portland, Maine on September 28th. All right. Here are some gigs I got to tell you about that are almost sold out, but there are a few tickets left. September 28th, Portland, Maine, my old stomping grounds. Uh, what the fuck was that? The Comedy Connection I used to play up in Portland, Maine. Um, oh, my God, I remember that comedy club one time. The whole weekend it fucking stunk, and then they finally figured out there was a dead rat right above the stage. Oh, it stunk for fucking weeks. Uh, you go up there to do a goddamn guest spot. That's what it was. That wasn't a good... That was the old Portland Comedy Connection. Not, I'm not trashing that comedy club. People, if you want to go see a show that doesn't have a dead rat above it, come to the the Cross Insurance Arena, Portland Maine, on September 28th. On October 1st, Springfield, Massachusetts, at the Mass Mutual Center. Wasn't I just there? I was literally just there. What the fuck am I doing? I'm not selling tickets. October 4th, State College, Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm doing a college gig. Those are always fun. At Bryce Jordan Center. I feel like we're out of that time now. And we blamed college kids. And I think it was really uh, older generations. October 7th, Canton, Ohio. At Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium. October 28th, Reno, Nevada. At the Reno Events Center. Uh, November 7th, Norfolk, Virginia at Scope Arena. November 8th, Atlanta, Georgia, State Farm Arena. November 10th, New York City at Madison Square Garden. November 17th, Las Vegas, Nevada at Dolby Live. I will be at all of those places with a brand new act doing whatever it is that I do. All right, let's... Uh... Oh, no, what did I do? Did I get rid of it? Did I get rid of the document that had all of the shit that I needed to read? I think I did. Fucking moron. All right. Well, what do I do now? I go back to the email. Yeah, I got to do the emails here. Okay, here we go. Here's the re one read below. One read below. Also, please plug fall shows with limited tickets remaining. All right, I did that. Um, oh, look who it is, everybody. It's old Zip Recruiter. Uh, did you know that if you're an employer who's hiring, the average cost per hire is $4,700? If you're investing that much money into each new hire, you want to get it right. So what's the most effective way to find the best people for your roles? Well, it's old Zip. Um, see for yourself right now. You can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Burr and experience the value ZipRecruiter brings to hiring. Uh, Zip lets you try before you commit. There's no cost to try, Zip. Uh, you can post your, how many times do they say fucking ZipRecruiter in this? I run out of ways of saying it. Uh, you can post jobs for free so you can see for yourself, how effectively, how effective Zip, uh, uh, was the Jerry Lewis one, is at helping you hire. Lady, it's simple. Zip Recruiter helps you get hiring right. Four to five employers who post uh, get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try Zip Recruiter for free before you commit. ZipRecruiter.com slash Burr. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Burr. Spell out Burr, B-U-R-R. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. The smartest way to hire. All right, we have, I, evidently we have some great emails this week from the listeners. All right, best meal in Europe. Hey, Billy Tits, did you go off the rails in Europe? No, I didn't. I actually hit the gym a lot. I look great, you fucking cunt. He goes, I picture you eating dollops of rich cream 
and then bitching about your shoulder preventing you from getting back in shape. My shoulder feels great. I look great. All right? I'm turning it around. The green shirt diet is back in effect, even though I haven't been able to go because I'm, I'm, I'm still contagious. Uh, I mean that with love. Oh, okay. I thought you were being a cunt. All right. So I take back everything I said. Uh, what's the best food you had and was and in what country? Oh, Jesus. The best food I had. <clears throat> All right. One of the first nights. I didn't write these places down. I had this amazing food in Dubai. Oh, God. It was fucking incredible. It was all that kebab, Middle Eastern style food. It was fantastic. The atmosphere was great. And, um, which by the way, I heard that they were thrilled with the show and said I could come back whenever I wanted. So that's fucking great. I'm going to go back there at some point to see MotoGP or F and F1 race. Um, when I was in Prague, uh, Bianca Cristoval took us to a place that in Czech means side piece. I swear to God, something like that. And all I had there was the charcuterie board and the meat and the cheeses. The fucking, I got to tell you something. For a fat fuck country like my country and how much we love cheese. Oh, do we love cheese. Our cheese here fucking sucks. This cheese I had just at that place. This was just like a bar. People smoking cigarettes, having a glass of wine. And they brought this cheese out. And it, it like my eyes almost rolled in the back of my head when I was eating it. It was like each one was better than the next. The meat was so fresh and all of that. You know, our food over here is poison. It is what it is. But, you know, they paid off the right people in the government. They look the other way. So what they do is they make sure... You know, major sport sporting events aren't fixed and stand-up comedians don't tell jokes the way they don't like them. That's what they do. That's how they make up for that. Um, and any candidate that can help you is immediately uh, branded as a fringe candidate. Um, okay, there was that place and... Let me see here. Then, you know... Prague and Dubai were the two places I had time in Greece. And then we kind of like, they were just became one-nighters in, um, in uh, Berlin, Stockholm, and Budapest. Like, all I, you know what I found in those places that I do remember was places to get coffee. So why don't I, why don't I give you those? Let's see if I can find those. Places to go. I got to scroll by all the American cities. Oakland. Lois the Pie Queen. There's something. Rhode Island. Warwick Ice Cream. I'm just going to give random shout outs. Um, Tampa. The Bad Monkey Bar. I don't even know what half of this shit means or if they're even still around after COVID. Um, all right. Here we go. Let's let's get it. Okay. Here. Okay. Oh, there's a place called Parlor. That's right, that we had breakfast at that was fantastic. This is in uh, Czechia. It's not the Czech Republic anymore. Czechia. Henri Espresso Bar. Un-fucking-believable fucking coffee. The man is an artist. Henry, H-E-N-R-I, Espresso Bar. Um, and let's see. Oh, I didn't get a chance to go there. Berlin, Cat's Orange. That's the last time I went there. Slow cooked pork, beef, or lamb stew. Uh, when I was in Greece, uh, Mocha, M-O-K-K-A, 100-year-old coffee joint. Oh, my God, it was fucking unreal. And when I was in Budapest uh, for coffee, I went to My Little Melbourne, or Melbourne, as they say in Australia, and get the piccolo latte. <clears throat> so there you go. That's 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 what I did. I, I was mainly just doing coffee and trying to eat light when I was over there. Now where the fuck is where the hell's the other reads here? All right. Uh 
Die Miami Cops. Oh, this was, this was the great bad movie that I watched on the plane. Uh, which, by the way, the Criterion Channel has uh, 70s cop mo uh, car movies. And I finally saw Steven Spielberg's first movie, Duel. And I thought when I was going to watch it, I was going to see, because it was his first movie, I thought I was going to see, like, hints of the great director that he was going to become, the legend that he is. And this fucking movie, right out, he was one of these guys right out of the gate. He was great. It's an absolutely gorgeously shot movie. Um, if I ever had an opportunity to meet him, I would ask him, like, how does the script work? How do you sell this movie? Because there was so little dialogue in it, and so much of it was a guy driving a, a car getting menaced by this big old 1955 truck. I actually looked up all the cars and trucks that were in it and shit. Gorgeous movie. Um, and then I also saw this French movie, Traffic, that was fucking hilarious. It had all of these really, really cool uh, European cars from 1971 in France. It was fantastic. Uh, they also have Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Uh, what is it? Crazy Harry and Something Mary. I saw that one a long time ago with uh, Peter Fonda. Uh, Any town's a good town when you bang a brud. It was that movie. You got to check that one out. Uh, but check that out on uh, the Criterion channel. All right, Die Miami Cops. Okay, first of all, great show in Prague. Nate and Bianco also killed it. Yeah, they did. That was the dream team, man. They were just, they were fucking destroyed. Uh, my wife from Detroit and I went on a day trip from my hometown, Munich. Uh, next to us sat people from Slovenia, Italy, and Bosnia. No way. People traveled from all over Central Europe to you and everybody had a great time. Oh, that makes me feel great. Um, if any of you guys were wondering whether the audience was maybe too quiet, they were just concentrating, trying not to miss a single joke. Yeah, we, we figured out that that's what it was. I thought you guys were great. Um, saying since English isn't their first language, it was a wonderful experience for everyone. You were talking on your podcast about the Die Miami Cops movie on the airplane. That was a bad one out of a series of dozens of films by the same acting duo. Yeah, Bianca told me, she goes, yeah, those guys were legends over there. She said, believe it or not, but the two main actors, Bud Spencer and Terrence Hill, were, were our 80s and 70s European teenage action heroes. That's cool. Uh, I believe that their original movies were shot in Italian, trying to be more serious. The German language version, however, were always dubbed in a more silly mode, so they became very appealing to young people. The same thing was also done with the British cop show, The Persuaders. Uh, with Tony Curtis and Roger Moore. Silly fisticuffs and loose lips in the German language version. Uh, the title, Die Miami Cops, only means the Miami... Oh, the Miami Cops. Oh, it was written in German. Like Das Boot. Die Miami Cops. I'm an idiot. I thought that they were killing Miami Cops. Oh! And it's pronounced D Miami Cops. It's the German plural article. Oh, so Das Boat is because there was one. D-I-E-D -E is plural because cops is plural. I get it. Look at that. Fucking learning something here. Anyway, hope this clears up the confusion about the dying or killing part that you were re uh, reading in the title. Go fuck yourself. Oh, absolutely it does. Thank you. Um, all right. The, the, nef the Nefertiti bust? What is that? Uh, hi, Bill. I'm obsessed with the pharaonic history and always looking to talk about it because I suffer from Egyptomania. The bust in Berlin you saw was Nef 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 Nefertiti's. I don't know how to say it. I'm so stupid. Sorry. It was found in modern day Amar Amarna. Don't you mean stolen? Like, why is it in Germany? Uh, she was an 18th dynasty royal and was running about Egypt in the 14th century BCE. Her story and family was kind of insane. Uh, I'm not going to try to keep saying this person's name. Nefertiti's husband 
was one of the most mysterious kings in all of ancient Egypt history. Oh, was he in the closet? Uh, his name was uh, Akin Aten. Uh, anyway, this guy turned Egypt upside down and got rid of all the gods and goddesses and introduced a single god called Aten. Oh, it was named after him? He then shut down all the temples dedicated to all the other gods and put all the priests out of work. What a dick. After that, he got rid of all the gods and instilled the single god. He, he then moved from the, from the capital Thabes or Tabes with a bunch of his followers and built a new capital city dedicated to the worship of Aten. The city, Amarna, ran for about 12 years until that dude died. The single god way of worship was hundreds and hundreds of years before Christianity. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, there's no doubt like Japan, India, Egypt, there was all kinds, and that's just the ones that I've been able to learn about were advanced cultures and have never been rec recognized in Western history. Uh, this single god was the Aten, and it was the sun disk. The sun rays, it was depicted with little hands at the end of the sun rays and was the world's first expression of mon monotheism. I guess that's just believing one god. We believe in one god, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, um, and sociopaths and all kinds of other horrible fucking people that he doesn't take any credit for. He just blames it on the devil. Uh, wrote all sorts of beautiful hymns for his God. It was wild times, and this guy was essentially a cult leader. Yeah, I was immediately thinking Dick Cheney. Um, just having that sort of, the, the right amount of craziness, lack of empathy, and balls to just be like, I'm going to mold this fucking country the way I want it to be. Um, I just need the right front, man. Uh, where was I? Uh, he also introduced a new style of art, which scholars call Armana period art. Art. It's incredible, and that is what Nefertiti's bust is. It was sculpted by a man called Thutmose. I apologize to all Egyptian people and anybody who's into this art. I don't know how to say any of these names. Um, had himself depicted unlike any of the pharaohs before him. He had a bunch of daughters with. Neferititi. Oh, that was his chick. That was his queen. <coughs> and they'd have themselves all depicted in daily scenes as a family. None of the Egyptian pharaohs had ever done that before. It was pretty wild stuff when you see the depictions. I'll leave some below. Uh, that is wild. It's almost like the first sitcom, a reality show family. When Akat had died, his successor, Tut, I love how he got a quick little name abandoned Amarna, the new city, and moved everyone back to the old capital, uh, Tebs, Tebis, Thebes. Tut then got rid of this single god and brought back all the old gods. Ah, that guy was an asshole dad. He's rebelling. I like Tut. He's going back to the old school way. Tut was a boy at the time, so it would have been older advisors. Oh, that made all of that happen. Oh, the plot thickens. So he didn't hate his dad. Maybe they whacked his dad. Akhenaten's son was the famous king. Oh, King Tut. King Tut to Ken Hammon. King Tut. But they're still unsure as to whether Neferiti was his mother. That's all, that's all really interesting. Love what you do, Bill, and always looking forward to hearing you on Mondays and Fridays. Go mummify yourself. I will say what I thought was hilarious. I never really thought about it. Was, you know, they'd never been able to figure out how the Egyptians built the pyramids uh, to the point that they were just going like, maybe it was aliens, you know? It's like, why can't you just say it was maybe the Egyptians knew shit that, you know, Europe didn't know yet? Why can't we just... It, admit that maybe there was a culture more advanced than us. That kind of goes against our whole, like, what we do here at the school, don't you see? We don't do that. Like our little fucking college pamphlet, 
You know, you know, when they see the Roman Colosseum, they're like, oh, no, the aqueducts, did aliens do this? They're like, no, the Romans did it. So, you know, I would say the Egyptians did it. <laughs> that would be my guess. Uh, how were they able to do that back then? Because they were fucking more advanced. They figured something out that, that white Europeans didn't. God forbid they get credit. All right. Eerily similar laugh. Dear Billy Red Tits, how the hell are you? Uh, been a fan for a while now and have been listening to the MMP for around six years. In those years, I have grown very accustomed to your laugh, uh, to your laughs, both your normal laugh and that stupid wheeze that you do when you say something you find funny. Uh, listen, every laugh I have is stupid because it's coming out of this dumb head. Uh, the other day, I finally put two and two together when I realized that your wheeze sounds exactly like Muttley's from the Wacky Races. You mean the Laugh Olympics? Um, I'm sure you'll disagree with me. I wouldn't. I love that guy. But that's just what Dick Dastardly's sidekick would want me to believe. Anyway, hope you, Nia, and the kids are doing well. Thanks and go fuck yourself. All right. What do we got here? A shit song. A shit song. Hey, Bill, I fucking hate Take a Walk on the Wild Side by the Velvet Underground. All right, this is one of these things. One of the, you know, like there's, there's always those songs that everybody loves and you love them too, but then there's some that everybody loves and you don't understand why does everybody love them. I can see why you'd hate that one. I'd say, hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side and the color girls say do... To do, to do. It doesn't even sound like he's trying. He would that like that whole period, the Velvet Underground, Andy Warhol, and all them. They were sort of like the original alt comics. I feel. Although I did listen to a Velvet Underground album, uh, and I was finally starting to get it because there's a lot of that stuff that I just I don't get it. But I'm also like hair metal totally makes sense to me. So just take it all with a grain of salt. Uh, anyway, this person says, I don't care about its stupid poetic meaning or that it's about heroin and whores. When it gets to the do, to do, to do part, I really just wanted him to take a walk off a fucking cliff. <laughs> um, I do like the saxophone solo. Um, which they ended up putting into like a jean, jeans commercial. I think it's like 20 years later. Wasn't that in like a 501 Blues commercial? Uh, song I Can't Stand. Hey, oh, Billy Prince of Bald Redheads. Long time listener here. Finally felt the urge to write in. You've had me cracking up on the Monday Morning Podcast for years now, but I've got something I need to get off my chest. Have you ever listened to uh, Hooked on a Feeling? I mean, really listen to it. No, I haven't. It's an absolute banger of a track, a classic, right? But man, every time it kicks off with that hookah chaka, hookah, hookah, hookah chaka, I feel like throwing my radio out the window. I 100% agree with that. Like, I don't know what that hookah chaka is. That just sounds like, you know, when we would write movies about cavemen when they had their own language, like that chaka from fucking uh, Land of the Lost. Like he would come in, hookah chaka, hookah, hookah chaka. And then the fucking little blonde girl would be like, you know, the slee stack are coming. Like somehow could understand the fucking language. It was so stupid. She never spoke his, no, maybe she did. I don't know. Am I really going to break that down? Anyway, this person says, now, I get it. It was the 70s. People were doing all sorts of weird stuff. Funky pants, wild hair. Who knows what they were smoking? What, as opposed to now with self-driving cars and lead, legal weed? That isn't even weed anymore. You start fucking tripping on it. Uh, but come on. It's like ordering a fine wine and then getting a rubber duck in it. Uh, yeah, it also, I always felt it sounded like really overproduced. When he's going, I can't fight that feeling. It's like a wall of like harmony. And there's this reverb or something on it that I always 
Like, uh, I got to be honest with you. I never got past hookah chaka, hookah, hookah, hookah chaka. It just sounded silly to me. Uh, but the person says, every time it starts, I think about, I think I'm about to hear some lost tribal chant or something. And then, oh, that's right. It's just that song. I mean, could you imagine it? If every great song decided to start off with some bizarre chant, like, like, hey, remember Stairway to Heaven? Yeah, what if it kicked off with ribbit, ribbit, ribbit? Ridiculous, right? Well, that's more of a frog noise, but I know what you mean. Um, now, I know you appreciate a good rant, and I can't help but wonder what you think about this. Is it just me? Maybe I'm overreacting, but every time I hear hookah chaka, I think of how much better the song would be without it, 100%. Um that was that weird period of like Cherokee people, Cherokee tribe, and everyone was kung fu fighting. There was this whole weird, like karate movies, us sort of finally addressing what we have done to Indians, sort of, but not really. You know, you know, you know, how liberals are. Liberals then just sort of make friends with the oppressed group, but then don't really do anything to help them. And then when they get kicked off of more land, then they go, I need to call, I need to check in with my Indian friends to make sure they're doing. How are you doing? I'm so sorry you lost more land. Is there anything I can do? Um, anyway, keep up the great work on the podcast. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this absolute uh, tragedy of a song intro. Cheers from the Netherlands. I, why, you know, I don't think you're going to really have anybody argue with that. I bet the people in the band, you know, I, I, you know what? I'm actually going to look it up. I'm even over right now. I'm going to look this shit up. So this is what you have to guys. You got to look up the 1973 Chilean coup d'etat. And you also have to look up. Why did they say who? Okay. Why did they chant hookah chaka? See if this even comes out. Okay, what does, in the first song by Johnny Preston, hookah chaka is basically some white backup singers trying to sound like they're doing an Indian, i.e. Native American war chant. According to Wikipedia entry on Running Bear, the singer responsible for the Uka Chaka is country western singer George Jones. I love George Jones. Jesus Christ. What does Uka Chaka mean in these two songs? Uh, the first Johnny Uka Chaka... Yeah, this is the same thing. Well, there you go. George Jones, he's probably like, hey, everybody, all these damn people in uh, uh, helping out the Native Americans. Let's just, you know, throw some Indian shit on that. I don't fucking know. He didn't talk like that. Um, Well, there you go. Yeah, I would agree. I think that that's fucking terrible. And it also, I don't know, I think that song's only okay. And it doesn't really take me back to the 70s because I never really heard it until, I want to say, uh, Quentin Tarantino used it in a movie. I can't remember. Did he use that in a movie? Or was it the other one? There's another one that starts with, he, he has one movie where they're driving away in a car and there's this really weird chant that's clearly supposed to be from a different culture, but it's clearly white people doing it, I think. Or maybe it isn't. I don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. Anyway, I'm babbling. Um, I'm babbling. I don't think I'm contagious anymore. Um, all right, that's it. I'm going to get on with my day here. I hope you guys all have a great day. Sorry about all my conspiracy theory, but it's just, uh, I don't know. It was a fucking tough Patriot loss. That's what I'm chalking this podcast up to. All right.
All right. I'll check in on you on Thursday.